Hello students, we are going to discuss on the measures of central tendency and dispersion today. So we will start by the measures of central tendency and then we will move on to the measure of dispersion. When we refer to the measures of central tendency, we also refer to the measures of location. The measures of location, all right? That's also what we refer to it. The measures of central tendency can be referred to, uh, referred to as measures of location. There are basically three things in the three measures of central tendency that we know, the mean, the mode, and the median. Now, these three measures are three different measures they are their advantages, they are their limitations, and they are different. Many people sometimes confuse these three different terms and take, for example, the mean, the mode, and the median to be basically the same in their interpretation, which is wrong. And we will have to be careful about that. So we'll, we'll skip those part where it's talking about self-learning as far as possible, otherwise we will take a lot of time to complete this lecture. There are certain things that, as you would note, when I put as self-learning, they are meant to be straightforward and things that you can go and read on your own and understand on your own. So, I think you need to understand what the arithmetic mean is about, the mean, right, which is also referred to as the average. And normally the average is obtained by applying this formula. And this formula means what? For those who do not, who are not very used to such uh, symbols and everything, I'm going to explain in a moment. But rapidly, uh, the average, what is it about? It's going to be a kind of typical value. It's going to be a typical value which summarizes a all data. If, for example, I ask you, what is your pocket money, each and every one of you? Each and every one start to say 200 rupees per week, other people say 500 rupees per week, let's suppose, and it goes on like that. I will have a series of data. But if I want to summarize that data into one typical value, which uh, into what typical value which will be representative of the whole class, I may wish to use the average. The average will basically be a typical value for all these different possible values that you have. We'll summarize them. That is why we call, for example, the mean, mode, median, and other measures that we're going to discuss later on as summary measures, all right? Summary measures. Now, what is this formula about? And then we'll talk about the interpretation of the normal, uh, of, the, uh, of the arithmetic mean. Now, the, uh, this formula, whenever you see this symbol, sum, this symbol is what we call, in Greek letter, it represents what we call sigma. All right, capital sigma. We also have a small letter sigma in Greek, which is written as this. So just like we have our alphabet A, B, and so on, the Greeks also have their alphabets. And these are, for example, one of it is sigma, capital sigma. And what does this capital sigma stands for? It stands for summation. It means, in a simple language, that I'm going to add. Add what? So, let's take this itself. Let's take this part, <clears throat> only this part, to illustrate the concept. If I take the sum of x from i equal to 1 up to n, 
when you see something like that, what does it mean? It means that I will have to add x. x represent values. Just like here, you have a value. This could be represented by x1. This could be represented by x2. You see? x1, x2, and it goes on like that. So it says that you have to take x1 plus x2 plus up to x, where it finishes. Here, the upper limit is xn. So that is the idea of this symbol. The symbol is just basically means you are adding a set of numbers starting from i is equal to 1, that is from the first value to the last value. Okay? So, if we want to apply this formula in our context, what it does say is that, first of all, if you have to represent a mean, you usually use the bar to represent it. You usually use that bar. So, if you define your set of values as x, let's suppose we define it as x, then x bar represents the mean of x. The mean of x. And this is obtained by, according to this formula, by taking 1 upon n. n is the number of, uh, number, number of uh, elements that you have. How many elements you've got here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 elements. So 1 out of 6, and then multiplied by 1 plus 4 plus 2, because the principle says 1x1 plus x2 plus x3 up to x letter n. So what does it mean? x1 is 1, x2 is 4, letter n is 6 in our example. It's 6 because it's the last number that we have. We have 6 numbers in all. So we add all these numbers, which means 1 plus 4 plus it goes on until the last number 3. And when you do that in your calculator, 1 plus 4 and so on divided by 6, you will get 3.5. So this is how you calculate the mean. Very simple. You just basically need to add all numbers and divide by how many numbers you've got. But still, I wanted to go through that formula because you will see such kind of formula coming up again. <clears throat> so that was how you calculate the mean for a row data. We refer to that as a row data. Eh? Excuse me. We refer to that as a row data. Right? But then you need to understand that sometimes data are not like this. Data are sometimes grouped like this one. Okay? Data are grouped like this one. Then you need also to know how to compute the mean. But before I proceed on this one, I just want to come back here to just briefly explain something about the mean. When you got a value of 3.5, let's suppose you calculated the average income to make it more realistic. Let's suppose you calculate the average income in the class, the average pocket money rather, in the class, and you come up with a value of 300. What would that mean? If you have 20 students in the class, you took all the numbers, you divided by 20, you added them and you divided by 20, <clears throat> and you get 300. What does this mean? This x bar of 300, where x is the pocket money, this x bar of 300, I have two interpretations. There are two ways of looking at it. One is that it represents an equal distribution of that amount among all the 20 students. So if you were to distribute equally the, in the pocket money among all the 20 students, that is the amount that you would have had to uh, distribute. Another way of looking at it is that 300 represents the point of balance. What does it mean by point of balance? I'll take another example to illustrate that. Eh? The point of balance is a simple example to illustrate the point of balance. There are two interpretations to the mean. <clears throat> Let's suppose you've got a, a set of values that I'm going to put on a scale. 2, 4, and then 6. All right. Suppose you've got something like two values 
for 2, that is we've got 2 comma 2, we've got three values for 4, I suppose, and then you've got um, two values for 6. Now, if you look at this, just imagine this is a scale and you have weights here. If you try to find a pivotal value here, if you try to find a point of balance rather, where would you put the point of balance? If I put it at 2, all this structure will fall on the right. If I put it at 6, all will fall on the left. If I put it in between 2 and 3, and 2 and 4, everything will fall on the right. So I need to find a point of balance. And in this example, the point of balance would be automatically equal to 4. So then you would understand that the mean is equal to 4. You could compute it to check if it is equal to 4. That is, you take all these values, you add them, 2 plus 2 plus 4 plus 4. plus 6 and plus 6, divide by how many you've got, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, divide by 7, you will expect to get <coughs> 4 out of it, all right? So that's another interpretation. First of all, an equal distribution of a certain quantity, and then the other way of looking at it is that as a point of balance, all right? That is what the mean represents. So now I can move on to the next slide where how can I find the mean from such type of data now? That is what I'm going to explain next. There's a slight difference here in the formula, all right? In the previous one, the formula was sum of x over n. I can rewrite it like this just for information. It was written 1 upon n sum of x, but I can also write it like this. Uh, if I'm considering all the values, I may not, I do not need to write down i is equal to 1 up to n. If I'm considering all the values, I do not need to write i is equal to 1 up to n, okay? Uh, because it becomes obvious. So let's have a look at this one now. This is another formulation of the mean, you will see, but the formulation is slightly different where you are including f in it and the x also is a bit different you will understand later f represents frequency x represent midpoint this is the difference between what we had before x did not represent midpoint in the previous case because you were dealing with the raw data so x represent the values directly right but here x does not represent the values directly x represent the midpoint of a class because you are now dealing with a grouped data right in the previous case it was raw data but now we are working with grouped data so if you are working with the group data you have different classes as i explained to you last time but then x would represent the midpoint because you can't have all the values of x for example here you don't know what are the values how many values you've got between one and five Do, did you have one ten thousand ones did you have twenty five thousand uh twenty twenty five thousands two you don't know you have no idea this is why we use x as an estimate which represents a midpoint a middle value between these all right. Instead of looking at the values individually, one, one, one replicated and so on, we look at it as if we take a midpoint which has been replicated 693,000 times. And you take the midpoint which is replicated 88,000 times because you don't know the values. So this is why you take X multiplied by F, where X represents the midpoint. And the sum of F is the total frequency which is also uh, similar to the total number of uh, values that you have for. So let's try to implement this and calculate the mean for this data, okay? Let's try to calculate the mean for this data. Look at the difference. In the previous case, you added the values, you divide by n, you were done. 
but here it's going to be slightly different. Just bear in mind this formula and then we'll do it in Excel uh, for the sake of uh, to avoid wasting much time. So here we go. We've got our data here, the time. We've got the less than. So we need to compute the midpoint. For example, the midpoint would be to obtain by taking 0 plus 1 divided by uh, plus 1. We'll take it as 1 because normally it's not supposed to be 1. It is 0 0.999. But we'll take it as 1. 0 plus 1 divided by 2, which is going to be 0 0.5. And 1 plus 5 divided by 2, which is going to be a 3. And it goes on like that. So that's what I'm going to do right now to calculate the mid point. And this is what I get. So remember that the formula is the sum of f times x. So first of all, you have your f here. And you have your x, which you have obtained. Then the formula says you need to add the f times x. In other words, you need to take f multiplied by x first. You have a column that we will refer to as fx. And this is equal to what? It's going to be the 21,222 multiplied by x, which is 0 0.5. This is what we do. And we're going to do the same thing here. 93,706 multiplied by 3. We do the same thing everywhere. So we are having a list of fx values. This is what the formula is about, by the way. It says sum fx, you see, sum the fx. So you need this first. The f you have it, the x you have it, you multiply them, and then we're going to add them. But this time it's not going to be from i is equal to 1 up to n, but it will be from over the number of classes that you have. If you have 10 classes, it's going to be added 10 times, all right? So it will depend on the number of classes that you have. So let's get back here. Sorry. We get back here. We have obtained our fx. What is the next step is to add. The formula says sum fx. Sum fx means you got the fx computed here. Then the next step is to add these fx, all right? I'm doing it in Excel. But normally, you in you would generally have to do it in exam setting, except if you are given an assignment to do. That's a different thing. But normally, you would be doing it in an exam setting where you would have to use your calculator. So please uh, ensure that you are used to your calculator. So this is what you get. You get the effects as you see here. The sum of effects is here. So we have two things. We've got the numerator. And we've got the denominator. We've got the numerator and we've got the denominator. What's the next step to calculate the mean? Would be to take the numerator, the sum of fx, divide by the sum of f. And here we go. We get a mean of 18.22. So let's just write it down again in the slide. So this was a question, x bar equal to the sum of fx divided by the sum of f. The sum of fx was here. This is what we did. Find the fx, find sum. Here we go. We just rewrite it down near properly and we get the final value 18.22. So the average time that the children that children spend in foster care, all right, is 18.22 months. That is how you compute the average finally for a certain uh, for for a certain data, okay? That's how you compute the average. So 
there is another activity that I gave you here. And what is this activity about? This activity is about deducing the mean, deducing the mean here. Remember that the mean is a measure of location. You remember in the previous case, I said, let's suppose you take two, four, and six. You have a set of values like that. The mean is four. Now, let's suppose I decide to change the location of these values. I say all the values that I've got, two, two, four, 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 six, and six. I decide to add one to these values. If I add one to these values, they become like this. So what is going to happen? These numbers will then change scale. It will just imagine you had the two, four as they were right before, but now they will move to the right, move to the right, which means it will be now three, uh, five, and seven because you have added one to these values. Originally it was two, four, and six. So originally the values were here, the values were here, and the values were here, but now they have been uh, moved to the right because you have added one to the set of values. And by doing so, you will see that the mean now is what? The mean which was originally four here is now going to be five here. So what is that? What has happened here? When you have shifted the values by adding one, the mean also have been shifted by adding one. Why? Because the mean is a measure of location. The location was four originally, but now the location is five. So what I just did here, I did not need to compute the mean. I did not have to do three plus three plus five and so on. To be able to find it it was so straightforward because if i knew this one and i knew the relationship is just adding one i already understand that the the mean here would be four plus one which is five so that's what i ask you to do in this activity all right you are asked to compute the mean here you have to calculate this one all right you do the sum of x divided by n be careful this is not a group data it's a raw data so it's this formula you are going to get the value the value that you get here you are going to deduce those values here but this deduction you don't need to take your calculator to do the calculation for you all right you need to show if uh, what happened to the mean for these sets of values based on what happens here because these sets of values they have a relationship with this one all right you have a relationship with this one so deduce the relationship and you will be able to deduce the uh, the mean as well okay so um, the next step is you have an activity that you have to do on google classroom and I will check it out later on to see if you have done it. You have a mode which I will leave to you, which is a self-learning component, uh, which is straightforward. If in case you have problem understanding what the mode is, you will you are most welcome to uh, come back to me afterward. Okay, but these are relatively simple concepts. That's why I'm going to skip them. But I'm going to just go through the median for a moment. Okay, the median is going to be considered for a moment. Let's talk about the median now, rapidly. Let's talk about the median and then I will show you some how to get the median from a group data. If you have a set of values, the median is just obtained in a very simple way. All right. Uh, you can look at the slide, but I will show you another one. Let's suppose you've got a set of values like this. The first step is to order these values. That's what we want to do before you do the median. You order the values, and when you have ordered the values, you find the center. How do you find the center? The center is obtained by looking at the half of n plus 1f observation. Half plus 1f observation. Where is this observation located? All right. So half 
how many values you got? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 values. So of of 7 plus 1 means 4. All right? So you need to look for the fourth value. 1, 2, 3, and the fourth value is here. That is 3. The fourth value is 3. So if the fourth value is 3, it means that 3 is going to divide your data into two equal parts. Half of the data will lie before it and half of the data will lie after it. All right. So this is how you find the median. The same thing goes if you have an odd number, like this one, uh, an even number, excuse me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If you have an even number, it's going to be half of eight plus one, which is going to be 4.5. All right, half of 9, which is 4.5. So you look for the 4.5 value. 1, 2, 3, 4, and 4 is here, 5 is here. So the value that is in between 4 and 5 is going to be the median. So the value that is going to be between 2, the fourth and the fifth is going to be 2 plus 3 divided by 2. This value is the fourth, this value is the fifth. You add them, you divide by 2, you get 2.5. Five. So that's going to be the median for this example. It's a very straightforward procedure. Now, you have different advantages and disadvantages that you can go through. I'm going to go for this one. I'm going to explain to you how you find the median from a grouped frequency distribution. To find the median from a grouped frequency distribution, we will probably we have two ways of going through it, but one of it is the application of this formula, which I will go through first, uh, how to calculate this median through the application of this formula. The first thing is you will see that there is a term LCB. LCB means lower class boundary. This term lower class boundary says a lot about this formula. It means that when you are computing the median, you are not referring to lower class limits, but you are referring to lower class boundary, which means that your data is assumed to be continuous. If your data is not continuous, your first step would be to convert your data into a continuous distribution. I will continue on that in a moment, but then look at this. You will see that there is another term that comes in the formula so many times, median class, all right? We want to know what this median class is, all right? The, there are different classes, one, two, etc. One of these classes is the median class. One of these different classes is a median class. What does it mean? It means that one of these classes will have the median in it. One of these classes will add the median in it. For example, let's suppose this is a median class. Let's suppose it is a median class. So the median will be located between these two values. All right. That's what we understand by the median class. But there is a way of finding it. I'm going to explain in a moment. And then in the formula, there is n plus 1. In fact, n represents the sum of f, all right, the total frequency, as you can see here. And then there is CF. CF represents cumulative frequency. All right. Cumulative frequency to the median class and frequency of median class. So let me just now go through these components one by one. One of the things that comes again and again, as I told you, is the median class. So probably before I attempt going through this formula, I will try to locate the median class. To locate the median class, what do we want to do? We will need to take half of the value here plus one or half of the value that you got here. Half of this value. This will give me the uh, total number of uh, children in the foster care which uh, are going to lie lower than the median. Are going uh, median number of months we are going to spend less than the median number of months or it will give me the value it's the same thing it's going to give me the value which is going to be the number of months uh, half of the number of children will spend uh, at least the median number of months or half of the children will spend 
less than the median number of months. So this is why I take half of it, because half refers to the median. So let's do that. Now, you may wish to add 1 divided by 2, all right? Uh, this is not an issue in this context, but in general, we, we, will, take, we will take plus 1 divided by 2 eh, to find the median class in a general context. But here, even if you don't do it, it doesn't matter because the sample is large. The number is large here. But in a general context, you would do plus 1 divided by 2. So let, me, let me do it plus 1 divided by 2. Because why did I do plus 1 divided by 2? Just remember the previous exercise where we took half of n plus 1 to find the median rank. When we found the median rank, this would give me the median from that. All right. So it's the same principle. So if you apply that, you will get 21,806, sorry, uh, 218,640.5. So now the next step is, what does this mean? This means that there are uh, 218,000 something of number of children who spend less than the median number of months in the foster care. So how would we know where is this median located? Is it located here? Here, here, where is it located? In which class? To know that, we can't work with the frequency. We can't work with the frequency. We will have to work with the cumulative frequency to identify that. The cumulative frequency will give me frequencies less than. The cumulative frequency is giving me frequencies less than a certain number, less than or equal to a certain number. So, this is why I need to go and compute cumulative frequencies. From that cumulative frequency, I will be able to identify where this value is. Okay, so let's go and do that now. Let's go and do that. A, here we go. It's the same data uh, like what we worked here. So I will keep the other measures as they are. I won't change it, but I will add another column to it that we call cumulative frequency. The cumulative frequency for the first is going to be the first itself frequency. It's not going to change. But the next cumulative frequency is cumulate. It means that you need to take this 21,000 plus the 93,000. And when you will come to this one, it will me mean 21 plus 93 plus 88. And it goes on like that. But of course, if you have to do it in your calculator uh, in an exam setting, you will not, when you come here, you will not add all these numbers and this one. It will take a lot of time. So what do you do then? You take this previous community frequency, you add with this frequency, plus this frequency. And you get the next, the next one would be what? You take this community frequency, that is the sum of these two. This is what you have here. You take this plus this, all right, and this is what I'm going to do now. So this 203,000 has been obtained by taking this plus this. That is, now we get the cumulative for all these together, which is 203,000. So what do we do? We do the next step, the same thing, 203 plus this one, and it goes on like that. The last community frequency should be equal to the frequency, total frequency, all right? The last community frequency should be equal to the total frequency. You will see that the total frequency is here and the last community frequency is here. So this is an indication that what we have done is correct, okay? So what was next, what was the question? We were interested in this value. Where is this value located? That is, we say that there are 218,600 whatever uh, of children who spend less than the median number of months. The median number of months is not known yet, but this is the principle. 218,000. You would understand that 218,000 cannot be located in there because this means 200 and 
This means what? 203,000 children spend less than 11 months. This one means 272,000 spend less than 17 months. All right. So, in other words, if you are looking for 218,000, you would understand that 218,000 is located in this class here. I'm going to highlight it. It's going to be located in this class because it is this class that will give me the median class because 218,000 is found between 203 and 272. So what does the 272 mean? It means 272,000 children spend 17 months or less in the foster care. But me, I know that the median is some value between these two. So this is how I locate the median class. We have located the median class, but bear in mind something. That these classes are represented in its discrete form. You cannot work with it as it is here. For example, when the formula says the lower class boundary of median class, you have identified the median class. So the next step is to find the lower class boundary. The lower class boundary is obtained by taking 12 minus 0 0.5. And this upper class boundary, when you have converted into continuous, would be 17.5. This would be 18.5, 23.5, and it goes on like that. Not 18.5, excuse me, it's going to be 17.5, because you subtract 0 0.5, to 23.5. 23.5 to 29.5. So there would be no gap in between these different values, which means that they will now be continuous. But we are interested in mainly this one, so we'll stick to this. So we found the median class. The formula calls for the lower class boundary of the median class. So what is the lower class boundary of the median class? Maybe I will just erase a few things here. So the lower class boundary of median class is what? We just said it is in this one, okay, 12 to 17. But remember, this are lower limit. This is an upper limit because there is a gap between these two values, which means that they are discrete in their representation. But me, I don't want to represent, I don't want to have it discrete. I want it to be continuous. If I want it to be continuous, I need to subtract 0 0.5 here, which means that it's going to be 11.5 plus the first part of the formula is done, the lower class boundary of median class, which means that you find the median class first, and then you take the lower class boundary, which is here. And then it says the class width of the median class. The class width of the median class is what? It's the Remember that when you have converted, it is 11.5, but under 17.5. 17.5, but under 23.5, and it goes on like that, 5.5, but under 11.5. Now, we are interested in this, okay? Don't forget, you are not looking at the discrete case. You are looking at the continuous case. So the lower class boundary, the class width of the median class is what? 17.5 subtract 11.5 into half according to the formula of n. n is the total frequency here. Okay? Plus 1. Subtract the cumulative frequency subtract the cumulative frequency to the median class. Let's go back to the cumulative frequency because you see it subtract cumulative frequency. So where is the cumulative frequency to the median class? The cumulative frequency to the median class is not this because this is of the median class. The cumulative frequency don't forget, don't miss column. This is frequency, this is cumulative frequency. The 
medium frequency to the median class is this value 20 203369 so i write it there 203369 another way of saying it is before instead of instead of a 2 in the formula instead of using the word to the median class you could also consider it as before all right it's the same thing And then the old thing that you have here, you need to divide by the frequency of median class. Now we are talking about of. What is the frequency of a median class? Not the community frequency, but the frequency of median class. The frequency is here. Of the median class is here. So we are not talking about before, but we are talking of. So it's 63,000. Here we go. 68,000, excuse me. 681. So that is how you will get the median. So the median will be a value that will lie between 11.5 and 17.5. So let us compute that and see what we get from it. When you do the calculation, which I've already done here, it's going to be 12.83. So this is the median that has been computed. What does this value represent? This value means half of the number of children who spend, uh, half of the number of children in foster care uh, spend 12.8 months or less. Half of the uh, number of children spend 12.8 months or less in foster care. All right. Half of the number of children spend 12.8 months or less in foster care. That's what it represents. Okay. So that is how you compute the median from a grouped data, from a raw data. We discussed it already. From a group data, you know how to compute the median. This one is straightforward. I leave it to you to understand it. And we are going to move to the measures of dispersion now. There are different measures of dispersion that we have. The simplest of all is the range. There's another one that we call the interquartile range because the range has certain limitations. For example, it is affected by outliers. So the interquartile range try, tries to cope for that. Then you have other measures of dispersion that we will refer to, which is a mean absolute deviation. There's another one that we will refer to as the standard deviation. But before we get the standard deviation, you would understand that there is something else that we call the variance. There is something else that we call the variance. These are the different measures of dispersion. There's another one also that we are going to discuss, which is the coefficient of variation. We'll get to that later on. So, we will skip a few things that are relatively easy. For example, the range is something very simple. You can read it on your own. But we will look at the interquartile range. All right, the interquartile range, the advantage over the range is that it is not affected by outliers because it is like a range, but a range for the centered part of the data, not the you are not taking the range of a minimum and the maximum but you are taking the range for the centered part of the data where 50 percent of data lies in between in the center all right so you will need to find this value which will correspond you will need to find to divide your data into four quarters and you will need to find this value which correspond to this part here and this value which correspond to this part. So this part means 25% of the data before it, and this part means 25% of the data after it. All right? And when you get these two values, which we refer to as the lower quartile and the upper quartile, you can find the interquartile range just by taking the difference between them. The smaller it is, the smaller the dispersion in the data, all right? 
means that the data does not vary much. So let us take, uh, let us go through this example of how to find the interquartile range. To be able to understand that, we'll take an example. Let's illustrate that. Okay. Suppose I have a set of numbers: four, five, two, and then seven. All right, and let's add another number here. 1, 4, 5, 7, etc. Alright, the first step to find the range and the intercortal range, as you would have noted, I divide the data into four equal parts. And you say that this lower quartile represents 25% of data lying before it. So what does it mean? Before means there needs to be an order in the data. You can't just take the data as it is. So let's order this data first. You have 1, 2, I think, um, yes, I missed the four here, excuse me. Yeah, we go. One, two, four, five, seven, and nine. So when we have ordered the data, we will need to find where is this lower quartile? Is it here? Is it here? Where is it? Okay, how do we get this? We apply this principle which says what? We'll take the total number of data that you got, we will add one and divide by four. Just like the mean, sorry, the median, we took half of n plus one, but this one, we are going to take a quarter of n plus one because it's gonna be a quarter, it's not gonna be half, okay? Because when you look at this arrangement here, you divided your data into four parts, this one, means that a quarter of the data lies before it. So this is why we call it the lower quartile. This one, a quarter of the data lies after it. This is why we call it upper quartile. But if you look at the center here, the value which divides the data into two equal parts, this one is not a quarter of the data that lies before it, but half of the data that lies before it. And this is what we referred to as the median. So the lower quartile is the first quartile, the median is the second quartile, and the upper quartile is the third quartile. So let us go and find out this lower quartile and this upper quartile on the data that I just showed you here. To find this, what do I do? I will need to take a, a quarter of n plus 1. So how many we've got here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So what we need to do is to take a quarter of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, so of 6 plus 1. So it's a quarter of 7 that I need to take for. And this quarter of 7 will give me the median rank. So what is the median rank? The median rank is... one point seven five. So, not the median rank, excuse me, I was wrongly saying it. it's the lower quartile rank okay the lower quartile rank is 1.75 so what does it mean now it means that the lower quartile is found between the first and the third observation and the second observation between the first and the second observation one would have been here two is here so the lower quartile is found between these two observations but three quarter way through it three quarter way through it all right so how would you do that it's by applying a method of interpolation i'll just explain it in a very simple way all right if you want to take half of n plus one you get half of, not half but one quarter of n plus one you get 1.75 it means that you need to take the first one 0.75, so 0.75 and you've got 2, but you are looking for 1.75. Let's take the first value, 1, which is 1 itself here in this example, plus this 0 0.75 means what? It means that there is a free quarter way from 1 to 2. There's free quarter way to move from 1 to 2. 
So if it is three quarter way to move from one to two, you will do three quarter, which is 0 0.75 simply. You can write it down as 0 0.75 if you wish. Of the distance that you have between one and two, between one and two is already one and two itself in this example. So the distance is what? Two minus one. So in other words, it is one plus 0 0.75 times one which is equal to 1.75 itself, because by coincidence, what is happening here is that the lower class, uh, the lower quartile rank is, uh, the value, the lower quartile rank is uh, the same as the value itself, because the first index and the second index is one and two itself. But let's do it on the other side. Now you would understand it better, right? I need to find the lower quartile. So the lower quartile is the lower quartile is somewhere here, and it is equal to 1.75. Let's do it for the upper quartile, and you will understand it. For the upper quartile, I do the same thing, but on from here to here, all right? So we will still do the same thing. A quarter of uh, n plus one, which was already 1.75. So, but we move from right to the left. Okay, so what do we do? The first observation now would be this one. And the second observation is this one. This is the difference. We are not moving from left to right, but from right to left to find the upper quartile. So the first observation is nine, and the second observation is seven. So if you take the first observation nine, you need to take the first observation nine, and then you need to move three quarter way, three quarter way, three quarter way to the second observation in terms of distance. Obviously, when you do that, you can't add now because if you add, you will move to the right. You will need to go on the left, you will do subtract. Three quarter way the distance that you've got between the first and the second observation. The distance is what now? The distance is 9 minus 7. Don't take 7 minus 9, but 9 minus 7. That is the distance now. So it's a little bit different with, with the previous one. All right. So it's 0 0.75 multiplied by 2. So you have 9 minus 0 0.75 multiplied by 2. So the upper quartile is 7.5. Just bear that in mind when you are moving from left to right for the lower quartile, you are moving from right to left in the upper quartile. And you need to look at this distance. If it was halfway through it's 1.5, it would have been easy. It would have been 1 plus 0 0.5 times the distance between 1 and 2. Or this one, it would have been 9. If it was like that, it would have been 9 minus 0 0.5, the distance between 1 and 2, which is basically 9 minus uh, 0 0.5 times 2. The distance is 2, so it's going to be 8. See, it would have been straightforward, but here it is 0 0.75, so you get the idea of how to proceed with that. Uh, but still, please go through it again. You can rewind and listen to what I just explained once again. And there are activities on Google Classroom. You will need to apply these concepts there. There's another uh, measure of dispersion that we call the mean absolute deviation. What is the mean absolute deviation? We'll start by it and then we move on to the next one, which is the standard deviation. The mean absolute deviation, let's try to understand the concept first, all right? For you to and then we'll get into the formula. Just imagine for a moment that uh, maybe I will create another screen first and then we are going to illustrate the concept on a different screen, right? Just give me a second with you. I'm going to illustrate the concept on a different screen.
Let's take this, this case. You see, when we talk about dispersion, don't forget whatever you are doing right now is dispersion. You want to know how dispersed your data is. If you take, for example, a set of values 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7 and 7. There's no dispersion at all in this data. All the values are unique. There's no dispersion. You start having dispersion if you get something like that. This is an example of a data where you have dispersion, you have spread, all right? And, but it is not as much spread as if you were to have something like that. This is more dispersed than this one. So we are trying to measure these dispersions through different methods, one through the range, one through the interquartile range. But now I'll move on to another one, which is the mean absolute deviation. So let's try to understand something. Suppose you have a set of values, two, four, and then six. What I may wish to do to evaluate the dispersion is like that. Try to understand the concept. I look at the center of the data. The center of the data obviously is the mean. X bar, which is equal to two plus four plus six divided by three, which is equal to four itself. Okay? This is what X bar is, the center. We take it as the center of the data. And then we try to evaluate the distance that we have between each of these values and its mean uh, and center. The distance that we have between each of these values and its center. For example, here we have two, we have four itself, which is a value, and we have six, which is another value. We have three values and the center is four, which is itself a value here anyway. Let's evaluate the distance. If you evaluate it, it's if you evaluate the difference between them, which we refer to as deviations, you get something like 2 minus the center, which is 4. You get another one, 4 minus the center, which is 4. You get another one, 6 minus 4. Uh, you get another one, which is 6 minus 4. You have three different deviations but obviously you are not interested in three deviations you are interested in only one typical example of a deviation and if you are interested in one typical value of a deviation you will do an average of these deviations so this is one deviation minus two this is another deviation zero this is another deviation two so we want to add these deviations and divide by how many you've got We've got three deviations, one, two, and three. So it's minus two plus zero plus two divided by three. And obviously, you will see that it is equal to zero. Each time you're going to do that, you will get zero. Each time that you're going to evaluate the average deviation, that's what we just did, the average deviation, you will get zero. So there is a problem here. The problem is that you are taking into account the negative values in your computation. But you have to bear in mind that we are not interested in the negative values as such because we are interested in the distance that we move from one thing to the other. Distance does not is not evaluated by negative values. If you move from Catrobon to Port Louis, let's suppose, to, to another region, let's suppose, whatever region, Port Louis, let's suppose it is 20, uh, 20 kilometers, 20 kilometer, when you move uh, from uh, the distance from Catrobon to Port Louis, I suppose it is 20 kilometer, I'm just taking out a number like that, and you move from Port Louis to Catrobon, it won't be negative 20 kilometer, it will still be 20 kilometer. So we can disregard the negative sign. And if we disregard the negative sign, we use this, con this uh, modulus. We call that modulus when we use this uh, bars, we are referring to these as modulus, all right? Modulus of a value, let's suppose negative 3. If you take modulus of negative 3, it is equal to 3. 
modulus of free is equal to free itself. So each time there is a negative, this operator that you see here, these two bars, which refer to modulus, will basically make the negative become positive. So if you look at this example here, you will have minus two, which will divide by three, obviously, because you want only one measure. So you will have minus two modulus, which is two plus zero plus two, because it's already two itself and divide by three. So this is what you get for divide by three. That is one and one third, okay, 1.33. So that is how you will compute the mean absolute deviation. What I just did here is the mean absolute, the mean absolute deviation. The mean absolute deviation, why? Because we are looking not at the deviation as such. We are not looking at the deviations as such. But we are looking at the absolute deviation. Absolute layer refers to the modulus, that is the positive only. We are not referring to the negative values. That's why we call it the mean absolute deviation. So that is the formula that we got here. When you see this formula, do not be worried by it. This is basically what I just did. I took the modulus of the deviations, as you see, and divide by the total number of deviations that you have. And this gives me the mean absolute deviation. So what is the kind of interpretation behind it? The interpretation of this value is that, first of all, you need to understand the bigger it is, the bigger the dispersion. The smaller it is, the smaller the dispersion. But in concrete terms, what does the 1.33 mean? It means like if you were to look at your data, you'll get an overall indication of how much your data is spread around its mean. The mean is 4. This value of 1.33 means that the data lies generally between 1.33 points around the mean, which means 4 minus 1.33 around the mean and 4 plus 1.33 around the mean. Just bear in mind that this, when you are doing, does not give you the maximum, but gives you an overall indication of how the data lies around the mean. The bigger it is, the more spread it is around the mean, obviously. So that's a little bit about the mean absolute deviation. We've got the same formula for uh, the uh, grouped data. What we just did here was a raw data. It was for the raw data. We're going to do the same thing now for the grouped data. Okay, just like we explained for the concept of mean, so we're going to do the same for the grouped data. And the grouped data, the only difference is that now we have uh, frequencies and the x in the formula does not represent the values but they represent the mid points don't forget these are the differences and x bar is computed not by sum of x divided by n but by sum of f x divided by the sum of f for the case of a group day for the case of a group data okay so these are the subtle differences that you have in the formula. So we are going to apply that on our data set and then we'll see how it goes. Okay, so let's do that on the Excel. So just be, remember something. We already have our frequency, which is defined by F, which is in one column. But what we need as an additional column is this sum of X, not sum of X, we need this additional column, the absolute value of x minus x bar. This is what we need now. And then we will take this absolute value, we'll multiply it by f, we'll get another column, right? And this is where we are going to take the sum of that column. So let's do it on Excel to illustrate the concept. So we have f, what do we want to do? We want to do the modulus of x minus x bar. x bar means the mean, don't forget. 
each time you have x bar, it's the mean. So you take the value of x that you have. x represents the midpoint. Subtract x bar. x bar is what we got earlier, 18.22. So we will take the midpoint, 0 0.5, subtract 18.22, but we will get a negative value. But I'm not interested in the negative value. I'm interested in the positive value. So this is what I'm going to do. I will do this for the positive value only. You are supposed to get negative 17.72, but me, we are taking the positive value. So that's what we do. And we are going to repeat that process everywhere. And we get these values. So we take 3 minus the mean, take its positive value. We are supposed to get negative value here, but we are taking the positive and it goes on like that. The next step is to have another column. F times X modulus of x times x bar. Remember the formula. Modulus of x minus x bar. So it's going to be the frequency multiplied by this x minus x bar that you got here. And we do enter. And we're going to repeat this process for everything. So it's going to be the frequency multiplied by the modulus of x minus x bar. Now, note that I have done it into two separate columns. Now, this is for the purpose of explanation. If you have understood the concept, I would suggest that you skip this one and do it directly for this one. So, just do only one column when you get the 17.72, multiply it by the frequency directly and put the value here. This will avoid you wasting much time in exam. All right? So, this is a suggestion to you, is just do uh, do it in one column, but me I'm doing it for the purpose of explanation for you to understand and then I will do the sum of all these values the, the sum of all these values and This is what happened to add all these values in your calculator. You will get this value here So This is a numerator that we are looking for we need to divide by the denominator which is sum of f remember the formula Let's get back to the uh, slide there So the mean absolute deviation is obtained by taking the sum of f times. So we have this column now. And we need to sum. We've already done it. We've already done it. Yes. Uh, second with you, I'm just trying to, yes. So it's equal to, So one eight three six five eight seven. It's one eight seven. All right, we'll divide by the frequency that you have here. The frequency is here. So we'll divide by the frequency four three seven two eight zero. Oh, sorry, there's some technical issues going on, but yes. we'll, get, we'll get out of it. 280. So this is what we need to do now. We'll get the solution now. So the mean absolute deviation is obtained by taking this value, the sum of f, f into x minus x bar, divide by this. This is 
So 13.35 is the mean absolute deviation. So the, the data means that on average, the months, uh, that the number of months that a child that a child will spend in the foster care lies between 13.35 months around the mean, plus or minus 13.35 months around the mean. So that is the conclusion of this. So then the next step is to move to standard deviation. What is the standard deviation? It's relatively easy to understand the standard deviation. So let's me, let me explain this one again. I take the same example. Remember that you got 1.33 here. Eh? I'm going to take the same example to illustrate the concept of standard deviation now. In the previous example, I took 2 minus 4 modulus plus 4 minus 4 plus 6 minus 4. I think you understand that adding these numbers divided by 3 means that you will get only one uh, overall representation of a deviation in absolute terms. Absolute term means positive values. All right. And this is what gave us 1.33 in terms of the mean absolute deviation. But now, you see, this in statistics always creates some problem. The, the, the modulus creates some problem in, math, in mathematics. This is why sometimes, instead of working with the modulus, we prefer to work with another measure that will get rid of the negative values. If you want to get rid of a negative value, let's suppose you have negative 2, you want to get rid of a negative value, one way of doing it would be to square the value. By squaring the value, you get 4. Of course, it's not going to be equal to 2. It's an inflated number, but one thing that you know it's doing, that it gets rid of a negative value. This was our issue. We add negative values, but we could not work with the negative values because we will get a, a value of zero each time. So what do we want to do then? Get rid of the negative values either by modulus, which is not always a good thing to do in mathematics. It creates some problem, which I'm not going to get into the details here. But for your information, it is not always uh, easy to manipulate mathematically modulus, uh, the modulus operator. This is why we square the numbers. So then, instead of having minus 2 modulus, that is, you get 2, what do we have? We will have 2 to the squared, which is going to be 4, plus 0, plus 6 minus 4, which is 2 to the squared, which is 4. And the whole thing, we divide by 3. So that is how you get the uh, standard, not the standard deviation, excuse me, we don't call that the standard deviation. It's something wrong here. We call that the V variance. What I'm doing here is what we call the V variance. All right. We want to compute something that we call the V variance. So the variance is going to be 8 divided by 3. Here we go. It is 2.67. Okay. 8 divided by 3, which is equal to 2.67. So that is the variance. Now, there is a problem with this variance. The variance is not working with an average of deviation. But it is working with an average of squared deviation. These are squared deviations. And they are not very good in terms of interpretation because this value of 2.67 is not easy to interpret. I can't come and say, okay, my data lies between 4 uh, between plus or minus 2.67 of 4. That doesn't make sense to say that, all right? Because if you do such things, don't be surprised that the lower range may go even to a value that doesn't exist in your data, okay? So understand that this doesn't make sense in general. In terms of interpretation, it's very odd. 
This is why, because we have inflated, you would know that we have inflated the deviations twice, we want to deflate these measure. We want to deflate this measure now. How can we deflate this measure? Is by the standard deviation. The standard deviation. The standard deviation means that you are bringing this 2.67 to a uh, scale which is relevant to the dev uh, devi uh, deviation directly, not to the deviation to the squared. So you take the standard deviation is equal to the root of the variance. All right. So you just need to take the root of this value 2.67 and you will get your solution to this uh, problem. So let me just calculate it for you, 2.67, and then I tell you. <clears throat> 2.67 It is equal to uh, 1.6 Free, free. Okay, it is equal to 1.6 free free. So the variance is equal to 1.6 free free. Uh, sorry, the standard deviation is equal to 1.6 free free. All right, which is a little bit close to the value of 1.33 that we computed earlier. So the interpretation is kind of similar to what I just explained to you for the mean absolute deviation. Okay, the data on average lies within plus or minus 1.633 points around the mean, on average. So, uh, this was the standard deviation. They have their limitations, that is, they are limited by outliers, do not forget. We want to compute the standard deviation for a grouped data now. When we talk about the standard deviation for the thing that we just did here, for this one, you would have observed that the mean absolute deviation, the formula was like that. Sum of x minus x bar modulus divided by n. But for the variance, what is it going to be? The variance is going to be sum of x minus x bar to the squared divided by n. Sum of x minus x bar to the squared divided by n, not modulus, excuse me. It's not modulus. Sum of x minus x bar to the square divided by n. That's what we did. And the standard deviation is the root. But just like we did before, this is for raw data. But if you are going to deal with a group data, you would know that the formula will be f. This will be sum of f. Where x would be the midpoint of uh, the range. And x bar would be calculated using the grouped data formula, right? So that's what we are going to do next. We want to apply the uh, standard deviation for the grouped data, okay? Which is this formula. Sh you should not be worried about the subscript, please. Don't worry too much about the subscript, even if you see them. You can disregard them completely, all right? They are... You, it's very simple if you just follow the explanation that I just did. So this is the formula. The sum of f into x minus x bar to the square divided by the sum of f. So I'm going directly to the standard deviation. That's why I'm taking the whole root directly. Now you will see that I give you an alternative formula for that. And the alternative formula is the best, all right? Because it takes less time to compute an exam and you will be less prone to make mistakes. Bear in mind that these two are the same. It's just expressed differently, all right? I'm not going to show you the mathematical process where this comes to this, all right? It's not the purpose of the course, but still just remember that they are going to be, uh, they are going to be, uh, they are equivalent basically. So this formula says what? If you disregard the root for a moment, we are talking about the variance, it says, Disregard the root for a moment here. Eh? We are talking about the variance. It says you need to take the sum of f times x to the squared divided by the sum of f. So you need a column that is 
f times x squared. And then you need to subtract sum of fx divided by the sum of f. I think you would understand that this is x bar. So you already need the x bar, but you need to square it based on what you see here. So you need to do that first, and then you subtract the mean to the square. It's a very straightforward procedure, rather than going through this one. So let's go through for this formula, eh, which is more straightforward for this one in our Excel file. So we're going to do it now. Say that we need a column f x squared. The column f x squared means what? Take your frequency multiplied by your x to the squared. All right your x to the squared, 0 0.5 to the squared, multiplied by f. 3 to the squared, multiplied by 93,000. 8.5 to the squared, multiplied by 88,000 something. This is what we're going to do. And then when we have got this fx squared that you got here, the next step is to obtain the sum. And the sum is here. It's a very big value, okay? When we have obtained the sum for fx squared, we will need to divide by the sum of f and subtract the mean. I would suggest that we do it right there itself. So we will we are calculating the variance for the time being, and then we'll take the the, the standard deviation afterwards. The variance is going to be equal to the sum of fx squared. Divide by the sum of f, which is the frequency here. And then this value that you got, you will need to subtract the mean to the squared. Subtract the mean, which we have computed earlier, 18.25 to the squared. And we get a variance of 290.77. So let me, be, let me just write it down there for you to uh, see what's going on. Eh? So we have already done the mean absolute division. I'm talking about the variance now. To find the standard division, we need to start by the variance. So the sum of fx, uh, the sum of, uh, oh no, it's not going to be easy to remember that, but we'll try our best. 272, Deux sept deux trois cinq deux quatre trois sept point cinq. Divide by the sum of f, which is already there. We already have the sum of f here anyway. Subtract the mean. This, you subtract the mean. I don't have a space to write it next to it, so I will just write it there. Subtract the mean that we have computed to the squared. The mean was um, 18.22. To the squared. And this gave you a value of two hundred and seventy uh two hundred and ninety point seven seven. Two 
290.77 so that is the variance so the next step is to find the standard deviation so the standard deviation is obtained by taking the root of the variance and you get the value that you are looking for the square root of the variance so maybe i'll just do it on the excel the standard deviation equal to If you take the square root, you get 17.05, all right? 17.05, there we go. So that is the standard deviation, how it has been computed. You have already computed the mean absolute deviation as well, so we will be okay with that. So that is how you find out the standard deviation you find out the mean absolute deviation the interpretation is similar to the mean absolute deviation in some ways all right and then uh, there are certain effects on the dispersion i'm just going to mention you directly if you have a set of values that you are adding like i explained to you earlier if you have two four and six if you add a set of num a set you add one to a set of values the mean was 4, the mean will now be 5. But in the context of dispersion, when you are adding a set of values, the range, the interquartile range and the standard deviation will not change. If the standard deviation was a certain value x here, it will not change by x plus 1, no, but it will stay the same. This is just for information. It will not change, it will still be x. It will change only when you are multiplying by a constant, okay? If you are multiplying by a constant, then these measures of dispersion will change. But if you are adding or subtracting, it will not change. If you are multiplying or dividing, it will change. Like, for example, if you decide to say, let me multiply these values by 2, All right? Multiply these values by 2. Then what happened is that if the standard deviation was a certain value x, now the standard deviation, I think it was, uh, what I, I forgot the value, we computed it, but whatever value it was, one point something, this standard deviation will now be twice what it was before. So it's gonna be two x, two times x, all right? Just for information. And we'll finish with this, the coefficient of variation. The coefficient of variation is a very important concept because it is a measure of relative dispersion. The coefficient of variation is a measure of relative dispersion. Relative dispersion means you are making a comparison. You see, if you look at these two factories producing a certain number of shirts every month, let's suppose. You've got a set of factories producing shirts every month. But one is a big factory, one is a small factory. Now, when you look at these sets of values, some people, if I want to tell you which one of these two factories is more consistent in its production, some of you, when you look at these two values, you might be saying that this one seems to be more consistent. Maybe some of you will say that compared to this one. But in fact, the reality is that this one is more consistent than the other one because you have to understand that there is an issue of scale here. These two are not on the same scale. So if they are not on the same scale, what does this mean? It means that you can't compare these two directly, the variation, the var you can't compare how consistent they are directly. Okay? And the consistency is going to be compared through Standard deviation, for example, you may wish to say, okay, let me try to find the consistency between, uh, let me try to see how the data is spread. If the data is spread a little, it has uh, more consistency. If the data is spread a lot, it has um, very little consistency in its production every month. So what do I want to do? Let me uh, find 
the standard deviation for example for factory A and let me find the standard deviation for factory B for example and let's try to see uh, what this gives. You have factory A and you have factory B. We have a standard deviation which I'm going to compute the standard deviation with the formula that I explained to you all right with the formula of sum of x minus x bar to the squared but I'm using Excel to do it but if you have to do it you you will have to do use your calculator and do the sum of x minus x bar to the squared so these are the standard deviation that I have I'm doing Excel I repeat you will have to do it in your calculator and see what it gives. You see that factory B has a higher standard deviation than factory A. The first thing that you might be tempted to say is because factory B has a higher standard deviation than factory A, it means that uh, factory B is more dispersed than factory A. So you might be tempted to say that factory B is less consistent in its production than factory A. But you need to understand that this is wrong because if just look at it visually, you would understand. If you look at it visually, you would understand. That's why I said some of you might say this one is having a higher dispersion. But in a general context, if you look carefully well, you will see that these values lies from 17 to 92 over a range of two digits. So it takes the whole range of two digits. But this one, it's over a range of four digits, but it's taking on, it's changing only over two digits, which obviously see that the scale already implies that the dispersion here is lower than this one, if you want to compare. But because of the scale is different, you see that it's giving you a higher standard deviation here. So it's not a very good thing to compare factory B and factory A, their dispersion when with a standard deviation. The standard deviation is affected by the scale. So if you compare them, you will have misleading interpretations and you will think that factory B has higher variation than factory A, which is wrong because just visually you can see that factory A has a higher variation than factory B. And to confirm that, we will apply the mean we will apply the coefficient of variation. To apply the coefficient of variation, we calculate the mean first, all right? We calculate the mean for these set of factories, which you will have to take your calculator and do it. I'm doing it in Excel to make things easier and faster, otherwise I will take a long time to complete this lecture, but you will have had to do it in your calculator, okay? So you would have here the uh, mean of these two factories. What is the coefficient of variation? The coefficient of variation is obtained by taking the standard deviation divided by the mean. Just look at the formula. The coefficient of variation is obtained by taking the standard deviation divided by the mean, and it is expressed as a percentage very often. The standard deviation divided by the mean. When we will do that in a moment, but just bear in mind. If you look at standard deviation, it shows, just looking at the standard deviation, seems like B is more dispersed than A. But I believe that you will disagree with that because when you look at it there, you see that A is more dispersed than B over a two-digit scale. And we are going to see if a coefficient of variation really shows that A is more dispersed than B. We are doing that by taking the standard deviation divided by the mean and expressed as a percentage, as I told you earlier. So we have 49.7878% of variation in there. 78% of variation for factory A. And we're going to do the same thing for factory B and see what it gives. Normally, you expect that when you look at these values here, you expect that this one is far going to be very far higher than this one in terms of variation right? because these values are varying over a two-digit scale compared to a uh, to a set of four digits 
values that you have. So let's do that. And you see now clearly the picture that this has far lower variation than this one. All right. But this was not the case for standard deviation. You would have had a misleading idea. So what is the conclusion of all this? Like this one is more than three, is more than 10 times the variation. Eh? If you look at this carefully, it's like if you take this to you divide, It's like 16 times the variation higher. The variation is higher by 16 times for factory A compared to B. So to come back to the slide here, if you understand well the coefficient of variation, it looks at the it's, it tries to compare variation. Right? Standard deviation cannot compare variation. But coefficient of variation can compare variation. Why? Because you are dividing by the mean. By doing so, you are basically bringing everything to a similar scale for comparison. So that's all. Don't forget to do your activities. And as usual, if ever you have any query, you are most welcome to uh, do to send me your query on your Google Classroom itself, okay? So, goodbye, take care.